nostalgia, irritable heart, traumatic neurosis, gross stress reaction. Throughout history, understanding and recognition of this disorder varied greatly. It got its current name only 40 years ago, and diagnostic criteria continue to change somewhat with each new edition of the DSM. Doctors have claimed at separate times no such disorder exists at all, and what people experience is instead tied to the former, or outright faked. Let's talk about it. Hi, and welcome to my corner of the internet. Glad to see you here. In this video, we'll discover the history of post-traumatic stress disorder, or PTSD. A disclaimer before I begin, I am neither a therapist nor a historian. I am just an ad who loves learning things, and I want to share my discoveries with you. All the sources I used will be linked in the description down below. So, what is PTSD? The American Psychiatric Association defines it as a psychiatric disorder that may occur in people who have experienced or witnessed a traumatic event. Its symptoms fall into four categories. 1. Intrusive thoughts or memories. 2. Avoiding reminders of trauma. 3. Different alterations in cognition and mood from from memory problems to ongoing fear, anger, etc., or emotional numbing, and four, hyperarousal, or being hypervigilant. As for trauma itself, S. Thagila, president of the Sidran Institute, which specializes in trauma education and advocacy, writes this. A traumatic event or situation creates a psychological trauma when it overwhelms the individual's ability to cope. So not everybody who experiences or witnesses a traumatic event will develop PTSD, but there is nothing wrong with a person whether or not they do or don't develop PTSD after the traumatic event occurred. First mentions of PTSD symptoms date all the way back to the time period of 1300 BCE to 609 BCE. Assyrian texts from Mesopotamia feature references to ancient soldiers afflicted with symptoms that sound remarkably similar to our current understanding of PTSD. Jamie Hacker Hughes, director of the Veterans and Families Institute at Anglia Ruskin University, said this in an interview. These sorts of symptoms after battle were very clearly what we would now call post-traumatic symptoms. They described hearing and seeing ghosts talking to them, who would be the ghosts of people they'd killed in battle. And that's exactly the experience of modern-day soldiers who'd been involved in close hand-to-hand -hand combat. And then there's the Odyssey, which was written presumably in the 8th century BCE. Odysseus asks advice about facing Scylla and Charybdis and is told this. Must you have battle in your heart forever? The bloody toil of combat. Old contender, will you not yield to the immortal gods? That nightmare cannot die, being eternal evil itself horror and pain and chaos. There is no fighting her. No power can fight her. All that avails is flight. Fight and flight. The two most widely accepted and first discovered responses to trauma. PTSD, or a condition that closely resembled it, was first recognized in the late 1600s. Swiss physician Dr. Johannes Hofer coined the term nostalgia. Soldiers reported despair and missing home, and also well-known PTSD symptoms, such as anxiety and trouble sleeping. Around the same time, German, French, and Spanish doctors described similar illnesses in their military patients. That same term was also used in 1761 by Austrian physician Josef Leopold. The next term, irritable heart, was used during the Crimean War and the U.S. Civil War. Despite the name, no physical heart symptoms were found in incapacitated soldiers. They were treated with arrest and light duties. Traumatic neurosis was used in the 1880s by two different neurologists, one in France and one in Germany. Hermann Oppenheim, the German neurologist, claimed that there was a physical disturbance in the cerebrum. This began the use of the term trauma in psychiatry, rather than solely in surgery. At the turn of centuries, Irritable heart made a comeback. During the Boer War, it was frequently diagnosed under its new name, Disordered Action of the Heart. World Wars I and II had an array of different names emerge, including combat stress, shell shock, battle fatigue. In 1941, Abram Cardiner is the first to suggest that the various stress-induced conditions in and out of the military 
were the same one. Acute situational maladjustment was the first PTSD-like diagnosis to appear in a manual, namely the ICD-6, International Classification of Diseases, in 1948. In 1952, DSM-1 came out. A condition called gross stress reaction is included there. The entry says, under conditions of great or unusual stress, a normal personality may utilize established patterns of reaction to deal with overwhelming fear. In many instances, this diagnosis applies to previously more or less quote-unquote normal persons who have experienced intolerable stress. The particular stress involved will be specified as 1. Combat or 2. Civilian catastrophe. But not everyone agreed on the nature and severity of the disorder. In 1926, German psychiatrist von Hofer claimed in a study that almost all cases of traumatic neurosis occurred in a war are a quote-unquote social illness in patients with inherent weakness who are motivated by compensation from health insurance. After that, the German veterans with traumatic neurosis are no longer given compensation. In that same vein, in 1961, the term accident neurosis is introduced. It refers to PTSD symptoms as exaggerated or faked to gain compensations. Miller claims symptoms disappear once compensation is gained. You might think, well, it's because psychiatry was different back then. Well, just several years ago, Dr. Dinesh Bukra, former president of the Royal College of Psychiatrists, said that PTSD is a, and I quote, cultural construct that is a reflection of the American healthcare system, which is dictated by insurance companies and pharmaceutical companies. There's an article in response to this by Natalie Frank, who has a PhD in clinical psychology. I'll link it down below as well. In my personal opinion, all these three cases of actual doctors claiming that the response to trauma is fake exhibit a very problematic pattern. First of all, if you have experienced a traumatic event and the symptoms associated with PTSD, you deserve help, including professional help. And if a professional doesn't believe in a certain diagnosis, they can potentially harm you or the patient that comes to them for treatment for that exact diagnosis. Second of all, it's not uncommon for people with PTSD to be in denial about their experiences and or their mental state. So someone saying that there's nothing wrong with it or you need to get over it can delay reaching out for help for that person. And PTSD symptoms, if untreated, can get more severe and more burdensome. Also, as someone who is diagnosed with PTSD, excuse me, what? Post-traumatic stress is a result of trauma, an experience that overwhelms your ability to cope. And diminishing that validating that, victim blaming at its finest. It outrages me. There's nothing inherently wrong with a survivor needing, for example, financial support, because for a given period of time, the symptoms are too debilitating for them to work. It is an injury, albeit not a physical one, and one needs to recover from it. Validation and treatment help way more than just brushing things under the rug. PTSD is a normal response to an abnormal situation. And none of it is the survivor's fault. On a slightly more optimistic note, let's talk about how PTSD made its way to recognition. In this next section, I'll mention different types of abuse and trauma by name. You can skip to this tag out here if you want. In 1962, Dr. Henry Kemp and his colleagues published an article called The Battered Child Syndrome. In it, they not only bring public attention to the effects of physical abuse, but also reprimand physicians for not detecting and treating it, and caretakers for not preventing and reporting it. That must have made waves, because in 1974, the US passes the Child Abuse Prevention and Treatment Act, requiring mandatory reporting for cases of child abuse. In the early 1970s, the Vietnam War and the women's rights movements lead to greater public interest and more research. Different variants of PTSD are described. Among them are post-Vietnam syndrome, rape trauma syndrome, abused child syndrome, and battered women syndrome. The thing is, you can pinpoint the specific trauma here just in the names. I think it's good that they have since moved on from this terminology. The nature of trauma is very personal information, and outing yourself just by naming your diagnosis, 
I imagine it would not feel great. But it has been good in the sense that non-military PTSD has finally started gaining traction as well. And then, in 1980, the DSM-3 is published. There, finally, we have the term post-traumatic stress disorder. It could be diagnosed in both children and adults, and it was at the time classed as an anxiety disorder, which wouldn't change until 2013, when the DSM-5 comes out. Diagnostic criteria were listed for the first time, the first of which was evidence of a traumatic event. Possible causes for PTSD are described as outside the range of normal human experience. Moreover, it was recognized that the risk of developing PTSD varied with the type of trauma. And after even more revisions and additions, we now have DSM-5. It moves PTSD from the anxiety disorder section to a newly created trauma and stressor-related disorder section. I don't think we are at the peak understanding of PTSD and other mental illnesses, because with so much unexplained and unexplored stuff going on in our brains, how can we say we've understood mental illness? But I'm happy to say that nowadays there are several treatment options, and even PTSD treatment guidelines made by the International Society of Traumatic Stress Studies. Different types of talking therapy are listed, including Cognitive Behavioral Therapy, CBT, Eye Movement Desensitization and Reprocessing, EMDR, Psychodynamic Therapy, Psychosocial Rehabilitation, Couple and Family Therapy, and Creative Therapies. As for medication, the only drugs that are currently FDA-approved in the United States are two SSRIs, Paroxetin and Sertraline. Brand names are Paxil and Zoloft, respect. They are both prescription medication, so please consult a professional you trust first. And don't risk your health by self-medicating, and I put that in huge quotes. Medication can help a lot if used correctly and under your doctor's guidance. And if you are a fellow survivor, know this, it wasn't your fault. You deserve recovery. You deserve feeling free again. And you're not alone. I see you. Thank you for seeing me. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up and I'll see you in my next one.